Welcome to Brainish English Stories. Dr. Bonnet, my old friend, had often invited me to spend some time with him at Ryham, and, as I did not know Auvergne, I made up my mind to visit him in the summer of 1876. I arrived by the morning train. And the first person I saw on the platform was the doctor. He was dressed in a gray suit and wore a soft black hat. Dressed like that, the doctor had the appearance of an old young man. He hugged me, and it was visible on his face that he was very happy to see me. He said proudly, "This is Auvergne, my town." I saw nothing before me except a range of mountains in that blue sky. Then, pointing to the name of the station, he said, "Ryham is the fatherland of magistrates, the pride of the magistracy, and the fatherland of doctors." As soon as I had swallowed a cup of coffee, he made me go and see the town. I admired the druggist's house. And the other noted houses, which were all black, but were very pretty. I admired the statue, and he told me an amusing story about this, which I will relate some other time. And then Doctor Bonnet said to me, "I must beg you to excuse me for a few minutes while I go and see a patient, and then I will take you to Chateau Guyon, so as to show you the rest of the town." And all the mountain chain of the Puy de Dome before lunch. You can wait for me outside. I shall only go upstairs and come down immediately. He left me outside one of those old, gloomy, silent houses. All the large windows of the house were half closed. Only the upper part of them could be opened. As if someone had wished to prevent the people who were locked up in that room from looking into the street. When the doctor came down again, I asked him about this strange house, and he replied, "You are quite right. The poor creature who is living there must never see what is going on outside. She is a mad woman, or rather, an idiot. It is a miserable story." But a very unique case at the same time. Shall I tell you? I begged him to do so, and he continued. Twenty years ago, the owners of this house, who were my patients, had a daughter who was like all other girls. But I soon discovered that while her body became admirably developed, but her intellect remained stationary. It means that she was growing only physically, but her brain did not work or grow. She began to walk very early, but she could not talk. At first, I thought she was deaf, but I soon discovered that, although she heard perfectly, she did not understand anything that was said to her. Violent noises frightened her, without her understanding how they were caused. She grew up into a superb woman, but she was dumb and had no intellect. I tried all the ways to introduce intelligence into her brain, but nothing succeeded. I thought I noticed that she knew her nurse, but as soon as she started to eat food, she failed to recognize even her mother. She could never pronounce that word, which is the first that children speak. She sometimes tried to talk, but she produced nothing but unclear and confused sounds. When the weather was fine, she laughed continually. But when it rained, she cried in a terrifying manner, which sounded like the howling of a dog before a death occurs in a house. She was fond of rolling on the grass, as young animals do, and of running about madly. And she would clap her hands every morning. When the sun shone into her room, and would insist, by signs, on being dressed as quickly as possible, so that she might get out, she did not appear to distinguish between people, between her mother and her nurse, or between her father and me, 
or between the coachman and the cook. I liked her parents, who were very unhappy on her condition, and went to see them nearly every day. I dined with them quite frequently, which made me to observe that Bertha, they had called her Bertha, seemed to recognize the various dishes, and to prefer some to others. At that time she was twelve years old, but as fully formed in figure as a girl of eighteen, and taller than I was. Then the idea struck me of developing her greediness. I wanted her brain to think about the things she liked or preferred. Maybe by doing this her unconscious intellect would react. One day I put two plates before her, one of soup, and the other of very sweet vanilla cream. I made her taste each of them one by one, and then I let her choose for herself, and she ate the plate of cream. In a short time I made her very greedy, so greedy that it appeared as if the only idea she had in her head was the desire for eating. She perfectly recognized the various dishes, and stretched out her hands toward those that she liked, and took hold of them eagerly, and she used to cry when they were taken from her. Then I thought I would try and teach her to come to the dining room when the dinner bell rang. It took a long time, but I succeeded in the end. In her empty mind an uncertain relation was established between sound and taste. She understood that whenever the bell rang, it was time for her to eat. So I carried my experiments further, and taught her, with much difficulty, to recognize meal times by the clock. It was impossible for me for a long time to attract her attention to the hands of the clock, but I succeeded in making her observe how the clock worked. I used a very simple way. I asked her family not to have the bell rung for lunch, and everybody got up and went into the dining room when the clock showed twelve o'clock. But I found great difficulty in making her learn to count the strokes. She ran to the door each time she heard the clock strike, but by degrees she learned that all the strokes do not the same value. And she frequently fixed her eyes, guided by her ears, on the dial of the clock. When I noticed that, I took care every day at twelve, and at six o'clock, to place my fingers on the figures twelve and six, as soon as the moment she was waiting for had arrived, and I soon noticed that she attentively followed the motion of the small hand of the clock. She had understood. Perhaps I ought rather to say that she had grasped the idea. I had succeeded in getting the knowledge, or, rather, the sensation, of the time into her. When once I had obtained that result, all the clocks and watches in the house occupied her attention all the time. She spent her time in looking at them, listening to them, and in waiting for meal time, and once something very funny happened. A very old clock didn't work properly. The clock stopped making the striking sound. She noticed it. She sat for twenty minutes with her eyes on the hands, waiting for it to strike ten, but when the hands passed the figure she was astonished at not hearing anything. So she was confused and felt as if it was a terrible disaster. And she had the wonderful patience to wait until eleven o'clock in order to see what would happen, and as she naturally heard nothing. She was suddenly extremely angry on being deceived by the clock. She felt that she was cheated by the clock. She took up the tongs from the fireplace and struck the clock so violently that she broke it to pieces in a moment. It was evident, therefore, that her brain did act and calculate within very restricted limits because I didn't succeed in making her distinguish between her mother and her nurse. She had grown up into a splendid girl, with a perfect round face, and had beautiful big eyes. She was sixteen, and I have rarely seen such perfection, such attractive and such regular features. 
She was fair with large, bright, vacant eyes, which were as blue as the flowers of the flax plant. She had a large mouth with full lips which were as pink as a rose. Well, one morning her father came into my room with a strange look on his face, and, sitting down without even replying to my greeting, he said, I want to speak to you about a very serious matter. Would it be possible, would it be possible for Bertha to marry? Bertha to marry? Why, it is quite impossible. I replied. Yes, I know, I know, he replied. But think, doctor. Don't you think, perhaps, we hoped, if she had children, it would be a great shock to her, but a great happiness, and... Who knows whether maternity might not improve her intellect? I was in a state of great confusion. He was right, and it was possible that such a new situation, and that wonderful feeling of maternity, which beats in the hearts of a woman, can change her vacant mind, and set the motionless mechanism of her thoughts in motion. And then, moreover, I immediately remembered a personal instance. Some years previously, I had owned a spaniel bitch, female dog, who was so stupid that I could do nothing with her, but when she had puppies she became very intelligent. As soon as I understood the importance of this, the wish to get Bertha married grew in me. It was not because of friendship for her and her poor parents, it was a scientific curiosity. What would happen? It was a unique problem. I said in reply to her father, Perhaps you were right. You might make the attempt, but you will never find a man to agree to marry her. I have found somebody, he said, in a low voice. I was shocked, and said, Somebody really suitable? Someone of your own rank and position in society? Decidedly, he replied. Oh, and may I ask his name? I came on purpose to tell you, and to consult you. It is Monsieur Gaston's son, de Lucelles. I was going to exclaim, the wretch, but I held my tongue, and after a few moments' silence I said, Oh, very good. I see nothing against it. The poor man shook me heartily by the hand. She's to be married next month, he said. Lucelles was a young mischievous boy of a good family, who, after having spent all that he had inherited from his father, he had wasted his money and was in debt. He had been trying to discover some other means of obtaining money, and he had discovered this method. He was going to take money from his father-in-law. He was a good-looking young fellow, and in good health. He came to Bertha's house to please her and her family. He brought her flowers, kissed her hands, sat at her feet, and looked at her with affectionate eyes. But she took no notice of any of his attentions, and did not make any distinction between him and the other person. However, the marriage took place, and you may guess how my curiosity was aroused. I went to see Bertha the next day to try and discover from her looks whether any feelings had been awakened in her, but I found her just the same as she was every day, wholly taken up with the clock and dinner, while he, on the contrary, appeared really in love. I called the married couple pretty frequently and I soon observed that the Bertha knew her husband, and gave him those eager looks which she had given only to some sweet dishes. She followed his movements, knew his step on the stairs or in the neighboring rooms, clapped her hands when he came in, and her face was changed and brightened by happiness. She loved him with her whole body and with all her soul. But Lucille soon grew tired of this beautiful, dumb creature, 
and did not spend more than an hour during the day with her. He only spent time with her at night. She used to wait for him from morning till night with her eyes on the clock. She did not even look after the meals now. She began to grow thin. Every other thought, every other wish, every other expectation, and every confused hope disappeared from her mind, and the hours during which she did not see him became hours of terrible suffering to her. Soon he stopped to come home regularly at night. He spent his night at the casino at Royat and did not come home until daybreak. But she never went to bed before he returned. She remained sitting motionless in an easy chair, with her eyes fixed on the hands of the clock. She heard the sound of his horse and sat up, and when he came into the room she got up and pointed to the clock, as if to say, Look how late it is. And he began to be afraid of this mad and dumb woman. And one night, he was so angry that he hit her. So again her family sent Bertha to me. When I arrived she was shaking and screaming in a terrible crisis of pain, anger, passion. How do I know what? Can one tell what goes on in such undeveloped brains? I calmed her by injections of, and restricted her not to see that man again, because I saw clearly that this marriage would kill her slowly. Then she went mad. Yes, my dear friend, that idiot went mad. She is always thinking of him and waiting for him. She waits for him all day and night, awake or asleep. When I saw her getting thinner and thinner, and as she continued in never taking her eyes off the clocks, I had them removed from the house. I thus made it impossible for her to count the hours, and to try to remember. The other day I tried an experiment. I offered her my watch. She took it and looked at it for some time. Then she began to scream terribly, as if the sight of that little object had suddenly awakened her memory. She is pitiably thin now, with hollow and glittering eyes, and she walks up and down continuously, like a wild beast in its cage. Then I decided to close the windows, to prevent her from looking to see whether he is coming. Oh! Her poor parents! What a life they must lead! We had got to the top of the hill. And the doctor turned round and said to me, Look at Ryan from here. Then my doctor friend was describing the town, its mountains and hills. But I did not listen to him, I was thinking of nothing but the madwoman. And I asked him suddenly, What has become of the husband? My friend seemed rather surprised. But after a few moments' hesitation, he replied, He is living at Royat, on an allowance that they made him, and is quite happy. He leads a very fast life. As we were slowly going back, both of us silent and rather low-spirited, an English dogcart, drawn by a horse, came up behind us and passed us rapidly. The doctor took me by the arm. There he is. He said. I saw nothing except a gray hat and a figure of a person with broad shoulders, driving off quickly.